and we're about to be live. And welcome, everybody. I am Robert Indici, and we are here for the breaking into the RPG industry. And we've got with us uh, people that have broken the RPG industry. I mean, broken into the RPG industry. <laughs> Daryl Ayers, <laughs> no, no, you were right the first time. Deanna Gilbert, and Greg Gordon. Uh, so let's talk about uh, how you got into the industry. Uh, we'll start with you, Brian. Well, uh, how I got into the industry, I began writing just um, freebies for Savage Worlds. I did that for a long time. Um, and then I pestered people on the Google, uh, the old Google forums, including Deanna, uh, just trying to see if I could get, uh, get the opportunity to write for Torg. And uh, I got a, a really wonderful email one day. That was really my, my main in to writing professionally which I now also do for Pinnacle. Nice. And how about you, Daryl? Uh, so I failed twice. Uh, once coming straight out of high school, I wrote an article for Pyramid Magazine and I got accepted and it was like one cent a word and I got my check for, you know, a couple dollars and I'm like, I don't think I'm going to be able to make a living at this. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, uh, I got a... The, the offers dried up after that. And then uh, around 2000, I tried again and uh, with a small press company, and I wrote a game called Hard Vacuum. It was basically not quite self-published, but small company, so, and we're all friends, so kind of fits, fits more in that self-published space. And like, that was cool, but we also didn't make any money, so back to the real world to work again. And then uh, after another round of layoffs, you know, decades later, I tried a third time, and this time it stuck. <laughs> I'll yeah, talk yeah. about some of the steps. <laughs> yeah, later. we'll talk about that. Yeah, in, in a little while. Um, Deanna, how about you? How did you get into the industry? Yeah, so about uh, 2011, I joined uh, joined Twitter, and uh, about the same time, I started uh, blogging for uh, doing talking about Dungeons and Dragons at the time and uh, got really excited about um, the new Marvel horror role-playing game that uh, that had come out and was talking a lot with the creators and some of the other writers and essentially kind of got a little bit lucky and started writing for, for that game for one product that unfortunately didn't actually reach print. Um, but that basically opened the door to writing for Firefly. Well, it's a credit. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I wrote for Firefly, and uh, I kept pestering uh, the the uh, folks at uh, Ulysses, when are you going to redo Torg? When are you going to redo Torg? Are you doing Torg yet? Mm -hmm. every, every six months, I was sending them, hey, just curious, are you doing Torg yet? And then finally one day, it's like, yeah, I'm going to forward this, forward you on to, to Shane Hensling. I'm like, and uh well <laughs> there you go nice i and greg gordon um my first gig taught me two very important lessons one is just being persistent because i was but i went to um origins and was bugging folks at sbi which was a board game war game company and at tsr to try to get hired on as an intern and uh, SBI decided to hire me and at the time I was in college in Minnesota and they're like, ha I am hired by a New York company. Ha ha. Goodbye <laughs> college. <laughs> got <in> my car. <laughs> Call my folks home in Ohio. And they went, yeah, we got bought by TSR. There's, there's no job. So, that, that, so it's extremely ephemeral and fairly quick tempered is the, is the, uh, <laughs> RPG. um, but later that connection, I worked on Dragon Quest, which is an old SBI product. So that actually got published later under the TSR imprimatur. So I have another TSR credit that came 11 years after or so after I wrote the wrote the product. Um, and uh, then James Bond and stuff like that from there on. Cool. Before we get too deep into it, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this panel, like this is one, this one was my request. Because when I was younger and trying to break in, when I would go to conventions, this was the thing that I would always look for. Like, I was hungry for it. Like, I wanted to know, how do I do this? Like, you know, I don't want to work at McDonald's or AOL or wherever. You know, like, <laughs> I want to do this. 
this is my love. I worked at AOL for like 10 years. It was great to me, right? <laughs> right? I think I'm here in a long winding path, right? But I was always <laughs> looking for that. And now that I'm here, like I want to give that back to anyone out there that's curious, that's trying to make it and isn't sure. Because the, like if I knew then what I knew now, I could have easily gotten into the industry in 91. Right, yeah. Like right out of high school, like no question about it. If I'd known the right steps to take at the time, no question. I'd have been a much worse writer. Like, I'd have been terrible. Like, I'd still be terrible if I'd gotten a job then. Like, it's better than it worked out since then. But, you know, you want to kind of, like, give that back to people. Anyone that's interested, that it is. And I think, uh, I think they're, it's so different. And uh, it's great that we have such a you know a wide range of uh, of panelists from people that are brand new to been in the industry a long time. Um, one thing I think you find from you know uh, old timers in the industry, uh, you know, usually got in by you know sending in sending in adventures or things like that. Um, and now it's much more difficult because because everyone has so much more access to um, to designers and to um, to publishers that it's, uh, it's kind of difficult to, to be seen. So in, in these days, uh, now, um, how, how do you think it's best for people to kind of get, get your eye? Well, I've got my answer, but I'll let other people go first. Greg, let's go with you since you, uh, you know, you're, you're the line yeah, developer I, for, for, we, for Tor we, we had, a, we had the, this panel essentially, uh, yesterday mm -hmm. in a sense of, start something, finish something, and then <laughs> point people to what you have finished. In our case, it's stuff that's on the Infiniverse, but you've got DMs Guild, you've got a lot of things because um, it is easier to break in now than I think it's ever been in the industry, but it's harder to get noticed at first. So you have to have proof that you can do a product. Once you yeah. have separated yourself as someone who can deliver a product, then it's not a super hard leap to getting published somewhere. And yeah, something I, that a lot. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, some, something that a lot of people don't realize is that um, they think that you need to have a lot of good ideas. And while uh, good ideas is a good thing to have, you know, ideas, <laughs> especially when you get into working with a good team, ideas will just come. And the important thing is, is to show that you can actually start and finish the product because like that's 90% of the time that, that there's a problem is, is, yeah. um, you know, especially and not just start and finish a product, start and finish a product on a deadline. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And so, and then I see the chat rooms filling up with other people that have done this, like Tracy and Eric and uh, Lehman. And it's like, yep. Yeah. Ideas are cheap, <laughs> executions, everything. Uh -huh. and, and, and it's like the big difference with third try at breaking in and my second try at breaking in. Second try, I did not have a product, right? I mean, it didn't matter that it didn't sell well. The third try, I could say, I did this book. And maybe it's terrible even, but the fact that I had done a book, like that one credit puts me ahead of 99% of everyone else that's trying. And like that gives you that huge, huge leg up. And now with things like Dungeon Masters Guild, Infiniverse for us, you know, and all like Scriptorium, like all these opportunities, these count as published credits. Like actually mm -hmm. finishing something and getting it up there, and even hey, maybe making a little bit of money off it. But it, like it counts, and showing that you could stick with it. <laughs> like and, and guide that project to the end, you know, it like is huge. And then the second part of that is, you know, like I'm going to jump over here like a little bit, you know, because there's a few bullet points that people need to know. Like one, know people. Like that's the hardest thing, especially because half of us are all introverts, right? But you've got to know. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and that, that's where this convention space is important. Like, this is where you get those meetings, you know, where, like, you talk to someone face to face and be like, cool, I did a thing. I don't know how to submit it. And we tell you, here is the channel, or there is no channel. Get out of here, kid. You bother me, you know, or, <laughs> or, or whatever. 
but even just having that that one conversation and they remember your name then when you do write that email and say I, i've got a submission it's like oh, yeah i remember i remember them like oh like that means something it shouldn't like and this is what like everyone will say is like it shouldn't be who you know it should be what you know but in the real world it's who you know and if you're an introvert or not that social like me make one friend who's good at knowing people <laughs> yeah. and, use, and use them, you know, as the bridge you know, to the next thing. Yeah. Yeah. The irony Fine. is that I mean, everyone needs an extrovert. Oh. Yeah. Right. Um, so uh, the irony in my case is that I, I kind of entered in, in sort of that special time that maybe you didn't really need to actually publish something. Like uh, the irony is that I say that you should show that you can finish something, but actually, I never did that because when I was starting to look into getting into the industry, blogging was a really big thing at the time. It's not so much anymore, but that was what allowed me to show that I could write and I could, you know, start something and finish something. I mean, it wasn't big things, so but it, it turns but out it, a blog is a, it's, a, it's an article, right? Like you oh, are sure. Writing, yeah. It counts. Yeah. Like that's yeah. finishing something. Um, but it, what was more important in my case and getting to what Daryl said about knowing people is that I was really enthusiastic about the things that, you know, Cam Banks and Dave Chalker in particular and, and, um, and Phil Menard, who is ironically the guy who inspired me to start blogging, you know, to do it. I just loved what they had done with Marvel Heroic and I let them know. And eventually, it's at some point, I basically joked about, you know, yeah, it would be really cool to, you know, write a data file for the X Men or something. And Cam says, "Well, just send something to me." And I'm like, "Really? Okay." And so he just gave me a, a really quick assignment, and I was able to write it and finish it and send it in. And then to add something to this is that I was able to show that I could be edited, and then give him feedback, and then come turn that around. And, and hand something in at that point. Right, well, so and that's the crucial one, right? So we talk all this stuff about getting your opportunity between knowing someone, like having that in, have I finished a product, da, 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 da. That gets you your shot. You know, at some point you're gonna get lucky and you're going to get that shot. And then it all comes down to don't blow that shot. Mm -hmm. And there are several things, there, there are several exits, <laughs> but none of them good that you can take if you get that opportunity. You know, and one of them is don't take feedback. Okay, yeah. you're done. You yeah. Know, like, that's totally like, even if you yeah, even if you turn in something that's not great, if they ask you to fix it and you do, again, that vaulted you over another ninety-nine percent <laughs> like of all you know oh. possible applicants. Yeah. And I feel like it's also related to that. I feel like it's also important to not be so precious about your your creation. You need it. It's always better when you can collaborate with people. Your ideas get cross pollinated and they just become better. And if you try to bunker it and protect it, then you know, I think you're doing yourself a disservice. Yeah, nothing. Everything looks better once you get at least even just one other person looking mm -hmm. at it and telling you why it's some of the things aren't that great. Um, mm -hmm. it, it just, it just is so much better to, to do it that way. Totally. I got a kind of a head, a head start on that because I have a, I, my master's degree is in creative writing and I've had so many creative writing workshops where my stuff was ripped to pieces mm -hmm. <laughs> right before my very eyes. I thought it was, Shakespeare, uh, I'm exaggerating, but I thought it was great. And I would look forward to, to people I know. And then, and, and then they pointed out very real and legitimate things. And um, after that happens a few times, you start um, being so protective, I guess, and open yourself up to some feedback and critique. Yeah, there, Let's make sure it's worth there, there was one. Yeah, there was one um, product that I worked on for Firefly that like Monica really showed me a lot of uh, a lot of stuff to, to learn how to, to do my work better. But there was one, you know, product that in particular I can remember where I, I handed it in and she uh, handed it back to me. And I swear to God, the entire thing was red. 
for for the replacements. <laughs> and I actually felt really bad. And I said, you know, is there anything you liked <laughs> in this? <laughs> and it was and it had nothing to do with the way I what I had done, but it was solely to get it into the voice of that <laughs> product and it and it to to unify it with everything else. And it was nothing like I what I had done was not wrong. It just wasn't exactly what was needed for that product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and here's a, a key thing: when you get the, that back, everyone, that's a good sign. If they hand you back a thing with red marking all over it or notes saying "please change this," they're saying, mm -hmm. "Good, you're close." You know, even though there's a yeah. million changes, like I want you to make those changes and resubmit this, and I'm investing time to tell you what I would like you to do. So that you'll get better and be able to do that next time. Ah. If I do, like some stuff, I will do that anyway, but I'm not giving it back to the author. It's like, no, I'm just fixing it because you're not even that close, right? Like, so <laughs> when the, if they just accept it and they're like, yeah, that's good and move on, then I get worried. Like, oh, oh, oh. although to some degree, don't be don't be worried too much if that doesn't happen because sometimes you're up against a deadline, you just don't have time to do the back and forth that it, it would be best, but sometimes you just have to make the changes and go. Agreed. So, mm -hmm. And I think, and, and part of that, you know, don't blow your shot when it comes. I think a lot of us spent a lot of time writing our own things before we got the opportunity to get paid for it. You know, maybe didn't publish them, but you know, like, oh, this is what I do at night when I get home. I write RPG stuff. You know, and maybe it's terrible looking back on it, like, oh man, this was really bad. I'm really glad I did not publish this. You know, <laughs> I've gotten a lot better since then. But that process of doing that, of doing the work, you get faster. You hone your ideas, and the most important one is you learn that you've got more than one idea. Or that you don't, you know, like if you're going to work in this, you have to have more than one idea. And if you feel like, oh, I got to hold that one back. I can't blow my one idea on, on this thing. Then you're holding, you're, you're not actually committing to the work and you never get past that one idea. So like, man, boom, get it out there and assume that there is another idea behind it and let that idea come. Yeah. And, and, and it, you know, sometimes life happens. I mean, I know people have anxiety issues and, you know, things just happen like your health uh, takes a nosedive or something like that. And sometimes you can't, you can't make the deadline. And at that point, it is extremely important to let the people know that you can't make the deadline because we will be, we will try to accommodate things or, or move something you know, around or do it ourselves or something like that. But if we're having to bother you, like if we have to continually try to contact you saying, Hey, where's this stuff? And we don't hear from you, especially if it goes past the deadline that at that point, it's, it's really hard for us to go, you know, we're going to work with you again, because like, even if the, what you had was good, we can't be sure that we're going to have it when we need to get it. Yeah, and you got to be careful because if you build a reputation for not um, following through, um, the industry is networked and um, it's not siloed. People know each other, especially when it comes to the big publishing companies. So, I don't want that reputation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I like to I like to paraphrase Neil Gaiman has a great saying, which I'm not which I'm going to say wrong, everybody. But the the gist of it is when you when you're a writer and you get a job, there are three things that you know, you can do to maybe get more work. One, you can do good work. Two, you can be on time. Three, you can be like a decent person to be around. <laughs> if you do any one of those three, you're probably you're going to keep getting work. If you do yeah. two of those three, you will be in demand. And the bar is pretty low on all three of those, right? And yeah. when, you think of, when you think about that, it's like, wait, really? Most people are only getting one out of three and the bar is pretty low. That's your competition. And, you can do this, everyone. Like, it's doable. Yeah, like if you're, and, and it, I, I go back to like show enthusiasm because that, 
like I remember when people tell me they really love my stuff and with that they would like to write for it. But if you're also the type of person to go on to social media and say how the company isn't doing a good job and how, you know, they should be doing things differently and stuff like that, that sort mm -hmm. of makes, that's like a big red flag saying that I don't really work well in a team. And, mm -hmm. and it really is important to do that. Like, it's not to say that, that you have to agree all the time. In fact, like me and Daryl disagreed on tons of stuff during development. Everything. Yeah, but but <laughs> we said the last thing is like, usually there was a point where we go like, you know, I don't really care. Like, I think it should be different, but I don't really, you know, I don't feel strongly about it. But often there were situations where he or I or Shane were like, no, I feel really strongly about this. And at that point, it's sort of a signal to the other people kind of going like, does it really that matter? Like, does that matter much to us? And it's like, usually, no. Um, but the, the important thing is, is that you're, you're not there by yourself. You're, you're part of a team. And if you can't sort of show up front that, or, or maybe it might be difficult to show that you could be a good team player when that happens, but you certainly can show when you're not. And, you know, usually it's pretty, pretty obvious when that's, that's a, a a bad thing that that to to have show up on there but well, if you're on me. time all is forgiven <laughs> well <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's a jerk but he's on time <laughs> i mean but it happens like like literally what right yeah oh cool walks in the thing hey walk <laughs> he, he worked on cyber paper he even did some stuff did some great stuff for us yeah, I did. So I would recommend uh, a couple of things. One, recently, Owen Casey Stevens has been publishing a bunch of brief oh, yeah. blips on here's what it's like to be a professional in the RPG industry. And I, you know, I graded as 90% 90 90 true. You know, it's, he's because he's, he's sort of ignoring some of the top end stuff. There is some, there is some better, but he's basically saying these are real problems you will encounter. If you can find that series and look at them, that'll that'll give you an indication of whether or not this is a career path for you. So related, I recommend that you sort of decide what your interest is in breaking into the RPG industry. Making a living at this is flat out hard. But mm -hmm. there is a pretty nice sweet spot for what I call making your hobby pay for itself that's a much easier bar to hit. And as, if you are willing to treat yourself as a professional, by that I mean, hey, you're going to have to keep expenses. You're going to have to keep notes on deadlines. You're, you're going to have to run it as a mini business. You don't have to go you know, overboard, but you, that'll do two things. That'll allow, this is unfortunately a, an American-centric answer because mm -hmm. American tax code lets you run a business from your home under a thing called Schedule C. So you can deduct all expenses basically up to that income. So your hobby can pay for itself in fairly short order. That's that's a bar you I can, if you can deliver on deadline, you can pretty much be guaranteed to meet. Make Buying your, board make, books is a right tax write off. Yes, that, that's right. <laughs> oh, yeah, I should have. So, uh... I should have done that this time around. What was I thinking? Yes, oh, if you're not if you're not firing at least a schedule C, I'd say at your level, you might I don't know if you've got a tax person or something you can talk to, but at your level, you may want to think about an LLC or something where you can shove a I mean, I run a I run a eleven twenty C corporation, which I had to do because I was working in the mobile games. So I still kept it around for this. But I call it I am a poor man playing the rich man's game, so I get by okay. <laughs> because corporations get away with crap humans can't. So mm -hmm. if you decide you want to, you know, Schedule C says if you make a thousand bucks, you can have a thousand dollars in expenses. C corporations go, you can make a thousand bucks and have a billion dollars in expenses. You're a businessman, and those can reduce your taxes from now into infinity. So you can sort of decide what level of complexity you want you want to endure. Um, but I say at your level, you're probably making enough. It's definitely worth looking to, into some official business organization. But for the average person starting out, I'd say sole proprietorship, Schedule C, 
Like, run at that, that, see if you're okay with that level of, of organization. Um, <laughs> and your hobby will pay for itself. Even before I did full time, I remember being just pleased as crazy that one year I got, I paid for Origins, I paid for Gen Con, and I paid for every game I bought. Nice. And I was like, woo! <laughs> yeah, like by, when I first got it, what, the, what, the, the, the suggestion about figuring out what you want to do is important. Um, in my case, there were two things I wanted. And one was I wanted to get into a position that when Torg was rebooted, that I could actually possibly do something, some little piece of work on that. And obviously that succeeded way more better than I could have hoped for. Um, but the second thing was to pay for trips to Gen Con. And as long as I made it up to do that, I was pretty happy. And, mm. you know, I still have a day job. I'm a weather forecaster by trade. And I don't see myself ever getting to a point where I'm going to be doing this full time. But I can do enough of it that it can pay for the little things that that I, I enjoy in this hobby. Yeah. So my goal was to be able to do it full time. Like, this is my day job. And here's some, some math. I'll drop some math on people that are interested in this, right? So when you're breaking in as a freelancer, not at the very first, but in general, your expectation is you're probably going to get paid about five cents a word. And many assignments will be between 3,000 to 6,000 words. If you're, once you've got your foot in the door and you're getting, you know, bigger jobs, you know, there, you could get 20, 30, 40,000 words, you know, at, at a time. And you then you've got to start doing the math like, well, how much do I write in a day? Do I write a thousand words a day? Some people say that's good. Like that's what I consider like a minimum day. Like if I don't write a thousand words, I'm in trouble. Like, uh oh, like some, something went wrong. And mm -hmm. then you're like, well, that's, you know, how many dollars? Not that many. And I got to do that every day. And that's where you've got to keep jobs lined up to where, you know, if, if I don't have another 3,000 words, you know, on cue for, you know, four days from now, I'm not making any money that day. And when you do the math like that, it comes out to you're probably looking at twelve to $15,000 a year if things are going well. That's not enough for most people, you know, to, to make it on. Now, if you're hustling, if you can get that up to 2,000 words a day, and if you're, you know, sustainably, then wait, now you're making decent, a decent living, right? You're well above minimum wage, you know, and where, what I tell people that are interested in like doing it as a day job, the, the best thing you can do for yourself is learn skill sets that support your writing. For example, when I learned to write inside InDesign and why I will tell anyone who will listen to me how to use it, you know, and get over that hump and layout. Layout pays like way more than writing. And when you can bundle the two together, suddenly your your earning power as a writer, you you you're you're just in a niche that you're gonna earn a lot more within. And also if you don't have that job, like for the next, that's going to hit the next freelance one, you can make your own book in the meantime, you've got all the tools necessary and, you know, go run your Kickstarter and do whatever. And it's, a, it's a scary thing. There's a, like a catch 22. When you've got a day job, you don't have time to really write full time. So you don't know what you can do. When you don't have a day job, if you don't have the writing, you go broke really fast and you're done. And that's what happened to me the first two times I tried to break in, right? Like, <laughs> like I gave myself a summer, like, okay, I'm going to try and make it writing. And if I can't, all right, I'll go become a teacher, which is exactly what I did. And yeah, like I made $13 over the summer and said, okay, that's not going to be enough. Like I cannot do this. And then, uh, you know, went through various careers then tried again and again made like almost nothing. Is that all right? Like I love doing this and I do it constantly in my spare time. 
and I'm getting pretty good at it, but I cannot make money at it. I was wrong. And that's what I like to tell people, like they think they can't make money at it. You absolutely can. It's not easy, but you know, if you once you can leap that chasm, like there are things on the other side. And the big difference on the third one was one, I had credits, you know, built up for my first two failed attempts. But two, I had made a lot of money in the tech sector. I'd been laid off and I knew from previous layoffs, it takes a couple months, right, to find something new. And I said, well, I've got six months where I can try to make a run at this. Here's what I've got to make. You know, here's what my expenses are. And when I don't make this, that will be failed attempt number three. <laughs> you know, we'll put it in the can. And I would, you know, but, but in the meantime, for that six months, rather than spending my time looking for new work until I have to, I'm going to spend my time writing and trying to make, you know, get paid for it. And I was shocked that at the end of that six months, I'm like, wait, I'm, I'm making it. I hit my number. I can keep on doing this. And it's only gotten better since then. So don't give up out there. And even if you try and fail, that doesn't mean you can't try again later in life. Yeah, I'd say if you're really trying to make a run at it professionally, one of the things you have to do is, um, it's not just, are you writing a thousand words a day? It's what is a sustainable model? And about the best I ever got to was 20% of my hours went to finding work as a freelancer. 20% were the revision or whatever stage or pitches, sort of stuff that was, you know, ongoing work, but there wasn't a pay scale for. So it was, it was work I had to factor in. And then 60% was what I was getting paid for. So you had to figure out how to make that 60% make you all the money you need. So if you're, you're working at five cents a word, you'll discover that really you kind of need to be doing 2,000 words a day during the times that you are, you know, doing your writing days if you want to try to make a, try to make a run at this because other things are going to be necessary for your job. So that's why that's why I really recommend first try it as a hobby that pays for itself because that's a lot easier level to sustain if you discover that that's easy for you it's not too hard to ramp up from there and you've gotten over the hurdle of getting products out. Yeah. And, and in the meantime you're building your chops, right? Like the more you write the faster you get. When you first start like a thousand words in a day is like oh man like how you're exhausted at the end of that. Once you've been doing it for quite a while, you're like, whatever, I crapped out 3000 words today and it was like, it was nothing, you know? <laughs> and like, that's, that's what you need to get to. And that's why the people that make big money as freelance, they're writing five to 10,000 words a day. Yeah. Like that's like and, a normal and, expectation. And to give a little sense of scale, one of our source books, like the, like the Starkold source book is about 65 to 70,000 words. 70K. Yeah. So magic number for those of you following at home, everything done in publishing is based on spreads, two pages put together. 16 is the magic number for spreads. So if you're ever publishing your own thing, do it in increments of 16 pages because that's the cheapest increment to print. Um, if you can't make 16 by eight, even if you have to print, print blank pages, be it eight or 16. And if you look at your game books on your shelf, every single one of them will be an increment of eight or 16. Or they messed up like big time. <laughs> like, there might be one or two like oh, they messed up. On that spread, you can assume on a, like a, on a professional project, you know, depending on the fonts and blah, 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 blah probably about 750 words are on that spread of two pages. And they can vary, but on average, that's what you're looking at. So if you're trying to make your own book and we're trying to judge how many words is it gonna be, if you've got illustrations or tables or anything like that, that's your math. Like number of pages divided by two times 750 equals roughly the words. And if you're hiring people to write for you, that's what you can plan for. More math, everyone. And it is amazing how many decisions go into because it fits in the spread or not. And and 
the, the worst case this. scenario is when you can fill almost half a spread. Because at that point, you either have to come up with an entire new page of material <laughs> or cut an entire page of material. And either one of those mm -hmm. hurts. <laughs> the, the real worst is when you have 16 and a half pages of good material. No. Like that's when you're just like, oh, no, no. <laughs> like, I can't cut that. Out. I can't come up with the same yeah. pages of stuff. Ah. We haven't heard much from Brian. You got anything to add there, Brian? <laughs> I don't really have anything on, I mean, I just busted, um, you know, into the whole layout scene, I guess, with um, Blood on the Blasted Lands for Tharkold. I was doing the layout for that, and so I did get to experience some of the stuff you're talking about. Uh, it's a yeah. lot different when you're just, when you're just everything. <laughs> yeah, we're just dashing out a, a, a word. Oh, hey, that's 3,000 words. That's what they wanted. Boom, send it. On, you know, send it via email and forget all about it. Uh, but it's totally different when you've got the thing that you've got to do the layout and that you know this, these five art pieces have to go in there somewhere. Every time you stick one in, everything gets all messed up and, and, and um, you end up with gaps or too much material. And uh, it, yeah, it is, it is a bit of work. Yeah. Yeah, one of the one of the things I, I sort of laugh a little bit is when people suggest adding, you know, you just have to add a couple of lines for clarification and explanation, and you're just like, I can't. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> There's no room. Mm -hmm. I got something else. Hard yeah. choices as a publisher, and yeah. as a freelancer, the the more of that pressure you take off us, the happier we are. <laughs> oh yeah, like I I was actually really. In a way, I was surprised, but I, 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 that I was, I heard this, but one of the things that made me realize that I could do this was my first editor said that I was one of the easiest people for him to edit. And I never really thought about that at that point. But, you know, like, again, it's, it's not so much your ideas, but if you can write, um, that actually is a pretty big plus. Yeah. Writers, if you can write, you're going to get a lot of It sounds stupid in a way, but yeah, it's, it's, but it's, it is true though. Yeah. And a lot of it is, is paying attention to details, um, knowing, obviously knowing grammar and syntax and spelling, uh, knowing, uh, but also it's knowing this, the game system you're trying to write for. Uh, reading, I think we talked about this also with the Infiniverse discussion, read a lot of it, so that you can kind of see how this game company likes to have their material laid out and what they like to see, so that you can kind of um, work with what's already in existence instead of trying to go against the grain, that can help a lot as well. You know? Read their, uh, most game companies will have a, a guide, you know, a style guide, read it, consult it, it is incredibly uh, important. Yeah, yeah, very important to, me, yeah. to make yeah. it easier on us to, to edit. Mm -hmm. yeah. And don't you just assume it. Yeah, because like right. it, different game companies might have slightly different style guides, you know? They're not going to agree on, well, on they're, they're, everything. So. I was going to liken it. it. It's like food franchises. It doesn't matter how good your burger is. You're not selling it to Panda Express. So <laughs> every, <laughs> every RPG line is... Yeah. A franchise and so you have to understand how that franchise is packaged and what constitutes you know a meal for that franchise because they it's a tremendously hard sell to sell something that doesn't fit mm -hmm. that packaging oh actually that's that, that brings up a good thing if you are given an assignment of six thousand words do not give four thousand or eight thousand mm -hmm. uh there is a leeway what? that's allowable Go yeah, ahead, like, yeah, like, so like 8,000, I'll take 16,000. Yeah. No, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but often, like, you, you really you, you don't have much of a choice on that. Like, mm -hmm. um, in that case, there's off, often a lot of a lot of editing, and, and especially if you have to take out stuff. But then, but if that was still really important, you need to somehow massage that in 
and you're yeah. almost rewriting the whole thing when you're when you're editing that stuff. It is, and that comes down to those spreads, right? So when you talk yeah. about like, oh, we wanted six thousand words because we had a certain number of pages that are going to flow into this. We've got two thousand extra words here. Like, uh oh, like that ends up like nine pages. Exactly the worst number of pages. Like only seventeen pages would be worse. Like. That is the second worst. Like now we have to, if we use this as it is, we have to write seven more pages or just like, I don't know, maps or something. Ah, you know, like, and that puts a lot of pressure on, on us and we're not going to be as happy, you know, in the end, even though what you wrote is fantastic and we want to yeah. use it. We're like, oh man, this is great. Like, and if we're really lucky, we can use it as a stretch goal though for, you know, one of our, our, our waves and we, We've done that a few times too, but still, it you still want to get it into the print. You want it in the source book, yeah. if possible. Like the, the cyber papacy is a good example, and I I was totally guilty on that one. As, I mean, as it turns out, there there was a good reason for having to have enough all those words, but still, we had to throw a hell of a lot out mm -hmm. of that book that really, really should have been in it. But when you have 144 pages, that is all you got. You, right. you generally mm -hmm. do not have the option to go to 160 whatever yeah. uh, at that and point. If it's, a, if it's a unique book, you can, again, especially if it's a unit of 16, okay. But for a line where it's like, yeah. well, no, these all have to be the same. Yeah. Like this is, this is a hard limit for us. These books are 144 pages. And if we have 132 pages of material, we got to go write some more stuff. Right. Like it doesn't matter if you told that story efficiently, like go figure it out now, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, we're all guilty of it. We all do it. And this is the fun thing. So like, and I, this is the same advice I give to game masters where they're like, Oh man, like how do I get to the next level? It's like, just keep doing it. You're going to make mistakes and forgive yourself for making mistakes and just keep going. That's and actually, listen. Yeah. I may have a slightly, slightly controversial take, but I'd say I've been, I've been getting quite a few, you know, people who are new to the program through the Delphi missions and stuff and going out and actively looking for writers and stuff. And I've noticed, at least anecdotally, a correlation between folks who are good DMs, good GMs, who struggle to put adventures together. Because... They are used to being able to take sparse instructions and spin them into something interesting. And so if they are struggling to fill out the description and give like, you know, well, you run into Captain Nemo and well, it's Captain yeah, Nemo. Right. And so <laughs> um, you have to, it's a, again, it's that franchise part. What are players expecting? What are the verbs the publisher always has to account for in effect? Um, so it is a learning process and good GMs to me usually start below the curve and end up above the curve. Yeah. So you just so, have to acknowledge that you're going to have to, you know, color inside the lines for a little bit and then you can start to, to branch out. Yeah. And so what I, the, what I always categorize that under is called doing the work. Because like some adventures do the work and they're like, oh, and here's the names of the people that you meet. And some adventures don't do the work. And like, yeah, you meet some people, like you, you can wing it or whatever. And it's like, mm -hmm. do the work on the adventure. And if you really want an eye opener, if you have a friend who is also a GM, write your adventure and hand it to them and don't tell them a damn thing about it and let them try to run it. And if you're really brave, watch it happen. And be <laughs> um, have, have it live streamed <laughs> by the yeah. person who made the game. <laughs> um, another, another, another thing that I just thought of too is at least for 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 Torg Eternity in particular, um, if you've got something that you can bring to the table that is fairly unique. That is a big plus. Like we, especially because Torg is such a global game, like uh, Lehman has had experience in Russia. He, he'd been there several times. Um, I was desperate you know, for authors who 
were from or had been to Africa for an Isle Empire. Yeah, yeah, I, I was, got one. <laughs> yeah, and um, but yeah, I mean, if you've got like a, a certain, um, a certain not necessarily point of view, but certain um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for uh, experiences, like life experiences, or, or at least if you've traveled to these places. It's better if you've lived there, but traveling there can can help. Or, you know, there, I'm going to rant, uh, not rant, but rave about uh, Nathan Smith, who's one of our one of our playtesters, and he did a one of the acts for Relics of Power. Um, he is an amazing. Uh, he is amazing at finding why your rules suck, and <laughs> um, why and part of I it is because. Yeah, part of it's because he's got players who will find the worst abuses that you can possibly do, but there, but he has um, the ability to very quickly figure out where your rules are going to cause problem, <laughs> and and you know even if I didn't have you know him to you know to um, even if he 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 wasn't a good writer which he is um just that mere fact that he can handle the mechanics really well makes it worth you know having him on on teams um now admittedly that's that, sorry just one sec and admittedly that's a little bit hard to communicate but this goes back to you know being enthusiastic about you know the stuff that we work on because we do notice that and and especially if you've got some sort of Unique uh, perspective. Perspective was what the, I was I was looking for. Uh, we will we will you know grab that that expertise and 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 utilize that. It, I mean, and as a adjacent to that, something you said in there, I think is extremely important. Uh, like as a writer, I mean, and just as a person, live, go do things. Right, like those experiences will inform you. I'm 10 times the writer I was because I've had these four weird careers and been to all these places, you know, and done like, all, like had all these weird opportunities or whatever. Every single one of them has made me, you know, prepared me in a different way and, and given me a leg up. Don't ignore those opportunities when they happen. Like live and then write to what you've lived. I'm just like a chat. I'm like, it's all true, Nathan. It's <laughs> <laughs> so we are kind of coming up on our time here, uh, but we have time for maybe one more. Let's go around and just kind of give your your sort of best advice. Daryl just gave a really great piece of advice, but maybe you can come up with another one. But uh, we'll we'll go around uh, starting with Brian. Uh, just give just a piece of advice to um, you know to help people break into the industry. I would say just um, try to be prolific if you can. This is a good time. Uh, PDFs are, a, you know, a, a game changer in this in this industry. We talked a little bit about DMs Guild and things like that. Um, for the longest time, I just wrote stuff um, for Savage Worlds usually, um, and just put it on a blog, right? And just people could download it for free. Um, then, you know, drive through or what do you call it? Uh, yeah, drive through RPG and DMs Guild and stuff like that are a really great way of getting your stuff. As long as it's up to spec, getting it out to even more people and actually making a little bit of money off of it. Yeah. I'll write a lot. How about you, Daryl? Got another one? <laughs> so yeah, similar to that. I was gonna like I put it under hone your craft. I mean, so when you write a lot, not only are you writing a lot, share it with people and look at that and look at the feedback, right? Like if, if when you've gone problems, fix them. And the one, like the biggest piece of advice I've ever gotten on writing was from Shane Hensley. And it was avoid passive voice. <laughs> and, mm. you know, imagine that was a baseball bat, like being smacked into your head over and over and over again, you know, like, you know, find and replace will. If you are using will anywhere other than as willpower, you're fired. <laughs> Start over. <laughs> so p people at home that are writing, write a lot and then go back and follow those rules. Like, you know, check mm -hmm. a style guide, you know, that'll say avoid passive voice. What does that mean? Go check your writing. You're astounded 
I was like, oh my god, that's like 20 that I found in two pages. And I'm mm-hmm. good. <laughs> yeah. like, oh, no. How about you, Deanna? Um, well, I don't. I think I've pretty much said just about everything that I could think of. But I'm going to answer Gray March's question that just popped up, where he says, "Do you think the mainstream success of D and D has made it harder to get noticed in a deluge of content?" And the answer is sort of a yes and no. And 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 it's yes because there's so much out there. But this is where I go into you know be enthusiastic and have something unique is. If you've got stuff and 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 can sort of, especially if you get uh, involved in the forums, uh, especially considering that I'm there uh, every day, pretty much, and you've got something that we can key off of, then that will raise things. Like Lehman, the reason we picked Lehman to, to in the end to do uh, stuff with Tharkold is because he had done a 100 plus page product where he basically did his his campaign and at the time at least that was by far the most you know expansive uh piece of work that was on the infiniverse and you don't necessarily have to do like the whole thing but if you've got something different than everybody else and you point it out then that can really yeah And, and the thing with dungeons and dragons is it's more opportunity right like with all that content that's out there we're not at, no one is in any risk of being like, I have had enough Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> yeah. There are more than enough Torg for me. I'll just stop now. That doesn't happen. Like the, yeah. the consummation of content expands, you know, exponentially times the audience. So it's just more opportunity. And how about you, Greg? So I guess, uh, so I, I, you know, follow off on, on Daryl's comment by saying, yeah, I believe the long tail helps you start it does make it harder to make it you know big for whatever your definition of big is but clearly it happens i hunt you know which started as basically a fate uh product is is going to be huge you know in another year and a half is yeah it's, it's awesome yeah and so yeah it can definitely happen and uh, i'll then end with saying we're saying it's breaking to the rpg industry if that's the goal Focus on being a professional. And so hold yourself accountable. Keep track of deadlines. So don't just write and say, I am going to have this done by August 15th. And and note if you do or don't. And then modify until you are making your internal deadlines. It doesn't matter if you have to stretch them out, compact them, whatever. So you know what you can regularly produce. And then that will be a huge leg up on when you actually start having to do it for a living. So you're not surprised because it's, I know for me, it's really, really easy to go, ah, I've got this. This is going to be easy. Let's take a look at my track record on that type of project. Oh, well, I was wrong. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> well, so, no. <laughs> yeah, so it, it just helps me. And you don't have to show it to anybody. It's just you. Just monitor yourself, know what you're doing, and hold yourself accountable. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Great advice, everybody. Uh, we've got one more panel. Sorry, not one more panel. We've got a game. We've got John Watson's Torg Eternity game uh, coming up here next. Yeah, so um, stay in the chat. Check out the game. Um, and tomorrow we've got the Torg Eternity novels with Richard Baker and Greg Gordon at noon tomorrow. Uh, noon Pacific time, that is. And then at 1 p.m., uh, we've got a Fading Suns panel with Bill Bridges and several of the authors from Fading Suns. Uh, followed by the closing statements for the convention. So thank you, everybody in chat who participated. Thank you, Brian, Daryl, Deanna, and Greg for talking about breaking into the industry. Good luck out there. Thanks, everybody. Keep going. Thanks. Bye-bye.